This is what was happening in the background at Holly School while Dave was the CEO. This is the tea, you guys. This is so crazy. Check the mic and make sure it sound right, boys. Hello, how's it going everybody? Welcome to my channel. If you're new here, hello, my name is Cam. And if you're not new and you keep coming back again and again, thank you. I really appreciate you. Today's video is brought to you by my Patreon supporters. Thank you so much for your support, you guys. I really appreciate it. Patreon is a platform where I post more personal kind of videos. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, there's a link in the description bar below. And with that, let's get into the video. Today, uh, we're talking about Dave Hollis one last time because I realized that throughout the month of November, I kind of covered all the... Um, Meltdown, the book that Dave came up with, the cancellation of his documentary showing, his new venture into potentially dangerous collagen. So, you know, all this stuff, I just wanted to sort of like um, tie this month of videos on Dave Hollis with a nice little bow. So I have read his first book, which I didn't read in due time when it first came out because frankly, I just struggled with his writing a lot. So I was very uh, much like, no, thank you. <laughs> so I didn't read it then. And now that I've read it, I really wish I did read it then. However, having read it now, after all the controversy, after everything that came out recently, after what we know now, after a year or two, um, after the divorce, it's very, very enlightening to read this book. This book is really just a, a bit of a roadmap on what not to do in a relationship. I feel like I understand Rachel and her decision to leave after reading this book. And I already knew, we already knew they had problems since day one, essentially. But now reading this and just kind of being aware of Dave's lack of understanding of women and relationships in general makes me think that Rachel did the right thing in leaving. And I don't know, I, just, I guess I just have a little bit more empathy for her. Oh my God, you can see that light, can't you? Sorry, I'm not, I'm not gonna fix it because I have so many notes to get through. Do you guys remember that Dave forced Rachel to give him the CEO title of her own company that she spent 15 years building up because otherwise he wouldn't have taken a job in the company? Well, it turns out that as a CEO, Dave says in his own book, that he was really just not very good. On page 21 of his first book, Get Out of Your Own Way, he writes, I was secretly sitting in the fear that our newfound success with the Hollis company was happening in spite of me, not because of me. And on page 22, as a result, we made less money, disappointed the community more than we should have, and had most of our team running too fast on a treadmill with no end in sight. This is what was happening in the background at Holly's School while Dave was the CEO, which actually prompted Rachel to essentially do some sort of like micromanagement or being the CEO without having the title of the CEO, uh, having to essentially hold the CEO accountable. This, this, this is mental. It's not meant to be like that. If you're the CEO, you're the one in charge. But obviously, Rachel was secretly still in charge while not getting the credit of the CEO title because Dave was getting the credit and doing a very bad job. They had a discussion. He wasn't listening. And that prompted her to send him an official email to essentially be like, hey, you're not doing your job right. So here's the email because this is something Dave wrote in his own book. Like, I would be embarrassed, my dude. The next day, Rachel sent me an email that was a hard read and a totally necessary kick in the rear. She used one of her superpowers, making things crystal clear. Here's what Rachel writes. I know you're passionate about building this company. I know that. What I asked was whether or not you're passionate about being CEO of a small business. It's very different than the job you had before. I worry because you seem to be approaching it in the same way. You seem to be doing what you know instead of asking questions, trying to learn and growing in the areas you aren't as strong. I admit my business weakness and failures all the time because in that humility, I'm able to learn and get help. It doesn't feel like you can receive negative feedback ever. Even last night, you never owned on any fault. You only blamed the team for not telling you what was going on. Of course, they should be more open than they have been. But even in that, the humble question would be, how am I showing up as a leader in a way that makes my team afraid to come to me for help? 
you tell me I need to tell you what I want you to do. You've been saying that ever since we made the decision to join forces. But my frustration comes because I shouldn't have to tell you the problems we have at work. Don't you get that? Your team shouldn't have to tell you the problems. You should be so in the business that you know our weaknesses and can work on the strategy to make us stronger. That's my frustration. You're not in the business, you're floating above it. A CEO can and should work from 50,000 feet, but not with a business team industry this new. Not when you have never done the work before. Maybe that's not what you believe, but that's what I believe. And my frustration comes from because I don't feel like I can tell the CEO of the company I founded things I'm concerned about. And then she goes on to essentially um, suggest a few books to read in terms of leadership and stuff to Dave. Like this is the tea, you guys. This is so crazy. Imagine being so bad in your job as your wife's company CEO that your wife has to send you some book recommendations. Not only that, but you forced her to give you the job in the first place. In order for us to make this decision, I had to step down as CEO, which was very hard for my ego. <laughs> Very So he's hard. the CEO. He's the CEO. Otherwise, um, he wouldn't have done it. He wouldn't have done it. Let me just start off with a few opening thoughts as we go into the nitty-gritty of this book. Because Get Out of Your Own Way was written, as far as I'm concerned, as very much a reaction to Girl, Wash Your Face. Rachel published Girl, Wash Your Face, a book that did really, really well. And... Uh, in the book, she was talking about Dave in chapter five, to be more precise. Rachel talked about how Dave and her started dating and it wasn't necessarily a very good look. Um, it didn't create um, an idea that Dave is this amazing man. In fact, it just kind of showed that Dave is toxic, as toxic as they come. But this book is enlightening in so many ways. I'm actually really, really shocked because he wrote this. I am 100% sure that he wrote this um, as like, here's all my excuses as to why I did what I did. I was so this and that. Seriously, it just feels like he mentioned that chapter several times in this book. And basically, I just think that um, this is uh, his retaliation like he's like well I'm also gonna tell my version of the story and everyone will know but actually like in telling his version of the story he just shows that he was indeed really toxic I can see all the reasons why she left him and I'm gonna talk about each and every one of them in detail because this is why I read the book for you so that you guys don't have to buy the book. First of all, I'm gonna start with something that he writes in the introduction where he says, reaching the low point all started when we decided to go on our most ambitious vacation ever. Yes, I'm gonna be that guy who complains about a vacation. He talks about, this is his opening, he talks about the chapter in Girl, Wash Your Face, where Rachel talked about them getting to date at first when she was 19 and he was 26 or 27. So literally, just as, as we start off, he goes in to um, ex explain himself, essentially. That's how I see it. That's how I read it. Not only that, but uh, it kind of looks very much so like Dave was an alcoholic. And, and we know that he actually has quit drinking since, and I think that's commendable. But also, in him writing this book, it really did show just how bad things were. And I don't know if I can actually have empathy for Dave in this situation. In fact, I actually get more sympathetic towards Rachel's situation. Having to be with a man that's drinking so much must be really difficult. And I'm sure that it was difficult for Dave too, but I'm just saying for me personally, I feel more empathetic towards Rachel in this situation. The reason I'm saying this is because of paragraphs such as the following. So I did what any good dad and husband would do. I left her to rest, called for a sitter to come home and take care of the baby, grabbed this book of hers and made a drink to enjoy by the pool while, while the boys played. My plan seemed so good. By the time I got the chapter about how much we struggle in our sex life, I stopped pouring soda. So they're on vacation, on their most ambitious vacation ever, as he just put it. I turned on a baseball video game I bought and shot myself inside with another drink while my family enjoyed the beachfront view. As you can see, Dave was very hardly present, even 
at a time when they're like on vacation. It's a good time when you're on vacation. And I understand that the fact that he's reading this and he's reading his biggest insecurities in Rachel's book that was about to be published probably made things bad. But this isn't this is still a vacation, this is still time off from work when you're not stressed or not as stressed. And I don't want to imagine if he was showing up this way on vacation, what was he like on a day-to-day -day basis when he was at work for like, I don't know, until 6 or 7 p.m. and then back from work but you're still like in work mode you're still stressed if on vacation he's just putting on a baseball video game and he completely ignores his wife and kids I don't want to imagine what he was like on a regular Monday to Friday because let's be honest life is mostly comprised of Monday to Fridays vacations and holidays make up a very small portion of the year he does mention a lot of we wanted to have an exceptional marriage type of statements in this book and we all know how that turned out to be and I just think that is basically uh, an indicator of some people that actually got really lucky or Rachel got really lucky Dave kind of leached off of that luck almost and I feel bad to say this because I, I know that he had his own con contribution and all of that but at the same time if it wasn't for Rachel's success with the book and I'm not saying it's all luck but there was there is a big portion of luck in there and I just think that they may they were so arrogant about it they really thought that this was all their own making and while it was I also think that they had a lot of luck the reason I'm saying this is to emphasize that if they were a little bit more humble and if they were a little bit more just kind of grounded in reality and they didn't take it so much on their shoulders as it is all me I've made this happen it's all of my doing maybe if they weren't that arrogant and confident maybe they wouldn't have shot themselves in the foot so easily because they really really just ruined their own careers very quickly even though they had something good going on does it make sense and i think this is all tied to their lack of humility their lack of understanding their strategy for motivation is very interesting while we had the conventional choose joy that we got from rachel you know the conventional toxic positivity that we're all so accustomed to Dave has a different motivation and his motivation is to imagine the absolute worst case in vivid detail because I needed the leverage of the most brutal things I could think of to get my ass off the mat. Not having my best friend by my side. Switching weekends with who had the kids once we separated. Pain can be incredible leverage. When Rachel has a talk with him, and I think we have had some insight of that talk because Rachel talked to Lewis House and she said, If I keep growing and you stay the same, two years from now, we're not going to be together. And when she had this talk with Dave, Dave's reaction was to imagine the worst case scenario and essentially um, get himself in gear, get himself motivated and get himself to a place where he's working on himself, which once again, clearly didn't help. But the reason I'm talking about this is because this also appears later on in the book. This strategy of his to imagine the worst case scenario and use pain as, a, as leverage is indeed a strategy. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna debate that. Obviously he considers, or he considered while writing this book, that that strategy was good enough and it worked for him. However, it's also a strategy that is very much anxiety inducing. And I don't know if that's something that one should teach. And this is, once again, why I have a problem with self-help gurus giving people rules of thumb and strategies that just worked for them, but uh, that may very well really cripple someone else. I'm not necessarily talking physically, it's more of a metaphor, but I imagine that people who struggle with anxiety might not have such a good time with this strategy. And, and this is why instead of spending $2,000 on a marriage retreat from Dave and Rachel Hollis, who are not therapists, who don't have any qualifications aside from their claims of having an exceptional marriage, this is why I have a problem with that. Because you could actually spend that money on a therapist who is going to work with you one-on-one -on -one and give you strategies that work for you and for your personality that will be, a therapist would know if you're the kind of person that is prone to anxiety and would not give you this strategy of pain can be incredible leverage. Do you see what I'm trying to get at here? These rules of thumbs 
are dangerous. People are not the same. People don't operate the same way. And when these gurus come out and talk about how this worked for them and so on, I worry that some people will really try their strategies and essentially give themselves a very hard time, but also after having spent like a lot of money on this terrible advice. Okay, moving on, <laughs> on page uh, 16 of the introduction, Dave talks about his view of the self-help industry and I think this is very interesting. So he says, I was suspicious of this kind of event and these kinds of teachers. I honestly thought they were charlatans, peddling feel-good mysticism to weak souls. If I'm totally truthful, I worried she'd come back talking about this cool cult we had to join. What was in that Kool-Aid? Essentially, <laughs> Dave, while being married to Rachel, who was in this industry, was still under that impression. And I think that he probably still is to some extent. I believe that what he wrote here is the truth. So I think what happened there is he noticed that there was money to be made in that industry. I don't necessarily think he just changed his mind. I just think he realized he could monetize that and turn it uh, into a stream of income, so he did. I think that him just writing these words on paper is extremely controversial because he is one of these gurus now. And I just don't believe that he drank the Kool-Aid. I just think he was like, Oh, I can make money? Okay, let's do it. Regardless of how much of a charlatan this person is, they're making a lot of money, so I might as well make some money too. We all know how much Dave has talked about therapy and um, he has this therapist whose name is also Dave. In this book, he had a different therapist who was a woman who I can't remember what her name was, but anyway. Um, so Dave is going to therapy. He's a good spokesperson for um, therapy. So I appreciate that very much. But then he does talk about what his initial idea of um, going to therapy was and he said, who needs therapy? Before I went, I was positive I knew the answer. Crazy people. Weak people, broken people, people who don't have supportive people in their lives, women, not men. To kind of go back to his strategy in life and in general in writing this book, I'm not sure how much I stand by the way he's going about writing this book either. And then he realized that it was a space where I could sit with someone who didn't judge me, didn't correct me, didn't try to explain things, and frankly didn't even really try to fix anything. And I was like, well, so maybe that was not a good therapist. <laughs> I mean, they are meant to like correct you, try to explain things, like fix things or help you fix things because they can't do it for you. Very much in the same vein as therapy, self-help to Dave was for, for broken people. And against my better judgment, I said yes to a thing that I knew had worked well for her, but I was still unbelievably skeptical could work for me. This felt cheesy and cultish. It is cheesy and cultish, <laughs> it, very much so. Moving on, on the same subject of the self-help industry. But if you've ever been skeptical of these tools or thought of those teachers as modern day snake oil salesmen who get rich by convincing insecure people to fork over their cash, I get you. I used to be you. Until I realized this money to be made. <laughs> Um, I think what happened here is that Dave was essentially recruited into the pyramid scheme that is the self-help industry. Anyways, so he does go to this um, self-help convention that Rachel invited him to. And this was, I think, a Tony Robbins one. And he said it absolutely changed his life um, and changed the way he thinks about self-help. I wonder if he still thinks the same way now after not being with Rachel and after he shot himself in the foot on Instagram and stuff. I wonder if he still believes in self-help. I'll tell you something though, unlike Built Through Courage, this book I think either had an editor or Rachel helped him write because it's much better as a read. Like, Built Through Courage was actually really, really difficult to get through. And this was boring. Actually, the second half of this was a lot more boring than the first half. So I did struggle to get through this, but it's better written I think I did, I did notice one mistake, um, for example, or a few mistakes, but one of them was here. I was struggling with brokenness, but not broken. 
I was struggling with brokenness, but I was not broken, I'm assuming is what he wanted to write. Um, so there were still like a couple of mistakes that I saw, but nothing compared to Built Through Courage where there were like actual grammatical errors and just it read really differently. It read as if it had not been edited. Uh, this is an assumption. I'm sure that he had an editor. I don't know. But this was better in that sense. So um, I wonder what that's about. He does this thing that Rachel did in Girl, Wash Your Face. And I think she also did it in uh, Didn't See That Coming, where he every chapter is a lie uh, that he told himself. And then he gives you two or three strategies to basically correct that lie. So... Um, at least in this book, he gives credit to Rachel because that's where credit is due and I appreciate that. He starts off with a chapter on his grand success at Disney and I will say that Dave does sound like he had a very interesting and fulfilling career at Disney. I wonder if he regrets that now because having left Disney, then Rachel divorces him, he's demoted from the CEO position and then, you know, he's on his own, uh, no longer has anything to do with Hollis Co. Um, then shoots himself um, in the foot on Instagram. His documentary is cancelled. I wonder if right now Dave is considering perhaps going back to working in entertainment. And if he was, I think that would be a good idea because he seemed to be good at what he did. At the same time, he does talk at length about how these movies essentially sold themselves because they the company had such a good reputation, the movies were so good, so you know he didn't feel like his contribution was all that good in the end because it didn't really matter all that much. The product was essentially too good not to sell. So it does seem like when it came to selling his own movie, Built Through Courage, he essentially failed even though he had so much uh, time in the entertainment business so many years as a career in that field he should have known how to sell a movie even though it wasn't you know, it was a it was a small indie if you want in comparison to all these pixar movies and disney movies and when it came to indies like that's where his contribution probably mattered most and it was essentially pulled off the shelves so i am appreciative of the fact that it's a pandemic and it's a hard season for the entertainment industry myself i have left the entertainment industry or I'm trying to so I understand that I'm empathetic towards that but at the same time I don't have the 16 or 17 or 20 years of experience that Dave had I had a few <laughs> under five to be more precise it's just kind of a different ball game when it comes to me but um, I would have liked for him to work harder on getting his documentary sold and in, into theaters instead of just giving up because the product is not a Star Wars or something. Because, yeah, sure, okay, yeah, I understand. And I, I agree with him. Star Wars is easy to sell to movie theaters. But where you get more fulfillment is probably where it's not easy and you have to work really hard. And obviously he does go um, into great detail about how he left that job because it was unfulfilling and took the job with Hollis Go um, where he felt he could have more impact. You could also have some impact in selling a small movie like your own Built Through Courage, which completely failed. So In this chapter, he talks a lot about how he identified with his job and his um, title at Disney. And once he gave up that title, he no longer had anything to identify with. And once again, I go back to the same idea that self-help gurus don't know what they're talking about. Because here's the thing, this, is, this would have been an opportunity for someone who really does understand how people work to talk about the fact that you shouldn't just have one thing in your life that you identify with. That your life should be composed of several different things. Like you should have hobbies, you should have friends that feel, make you feel fulfilled, you should have... I don't know, a family that makes you, gives you some sort of fulfillment and you shouldn't just extract meaning from one thing only because, and this is the danger right here, because once that thing is gone, then what do you do? Do you lose all your value as a human being, at least in your own eyes? Like that's what happened to Dave and I kind of wish I had a more like professional voice in this chapter who could actually explain why this happened and who could actually tell people what not to do and what are the pitfalls to avoid in that situation because Dave does try to but he just doesn't have the toolkit and he's not he's not a trained 
therapist or anything. He can't really explain why that wasn't a good thing. He can just say, don't do it. But like, okay, but what do you do instead? He does go on in the same chapter to talk about his um, partner, Chuck, who was on the job, like when he was like younger and he was working in this kind of type of selling movies business um, and Chuck knew, already knew people and people really trusted Chuck so let's talk at length about how trust is essentially the most important thing and despite his like attempts to have a good presentation and answer all the questions that people could possibly have just Chuck's um, trust that he had built with the partners that they were working with actually meant a lot more and that's actually a really good message i wish he had applied that message to his audience too because once he lost trust with his audience on instagram when they were asking him to feed noah and you know all the other stuff that he's done on instagram like that is the same concept that should have been applied there you should remember that just as chuck had built trust with his partners you are working with an audience and you should build trust with this audience in retrospect reading this book it does kind of sound a bit like bullshit like oh i'm writing all these things down but i don't necessarily live by these um rules i'm just I'm just like gonna write whatever in this book and I don't necessarily need to live by them, if that makes sense. It's essentially, I don't know if this exists in uh, in English, but in Romanian we have a sort of say, like do what the priest says, not what the priest does. <laughs> and I feel like this kind of applies here, like sure, maybe take some of, not all of Dave's advice, but don't do as he does, do as he says rather, um, because he is essentially not doing what he says uh it's it just came off as inauthentic a little bit and especially in retrospect i'm gonna skim through if you like some of these some of the stories that i feel like we've already touched on in the first uh, in my other review of built through courage because there's a few of these stories here that i've seen in built through courage and i don't appreciate repetition to that extent like you only have two books you are not meant to repeat all of the stories that you have in one book in the second book like because then what's the point in writing the second book in the first place but like once again i don't think dave has much expertise um in the self-help space etc so yeah of course he had to repeat himself because what else would there be to fill in an entire book so he does have several stories that repeat themselves like his harbor ship whatever nautical tattoo he talks about that he talks about his ally tattoo in this book he talks about the fact that tall people didn't run in this book however it does contradict his other story because in the second book he says that his mom was afraid because she had seen or heard of someone who died who was tall and was running or something of that sort and in this book he doesn't remember where he heard it so i'm not sure if he just remembered it in the meantime <laughs> since writing this book i wrote it in the second book but at the same time it's the same story and i'm not interested really in this book there's a lot a lot of chat about the imposter syndrome and i'm sorry isn't this the reason he quoted for pulling his documentary out of theaters one week before it was meant to go because he obviously lied about that we know that at this point that he lied about pulling his documentary but when he lied about that he quoted the fact that the documentary didn't include imposter syndrome my experience was yeah you can get there but also the fear that you have or the you know, self-doubt or imposter syndrome or whatever may in fact be something of a trigger that still presents itself and I want to try and capture that as well. And in this book, he talks a lot about imposter syndrome. So it kind of sounds to me like imposter syndrome is very much in the cards. It's very much something that he was aware of. Perhaps he even mentioned it in the documentary. I don't know. I've not seen that documentary. I'm just saying perhaps because it was included in this book heavily. And then he quotes it as the reason, like, oh, I just didn't talk about imposter syndrome enough. <laughs> like, it's very hard to... Uh, read this and listen essentially to Dave's thoughts with a straight face when he kind of gives himself away so much. There's also lots of things in here, lots of like advice 
um, that I don't know applies to everyone again. He says things that sound good but could very, very easily be empty. So he talks about disruption at one point. He says the person who's willing to own their imperfections and deviate from the cultural norm will embody disruption in a way that creates for them an unfair advantage in their life, their work and their relationships. Be that kind of disruptor. I don't know that this is true in our society. I don't know that um, it's all that easy. I think that very often disruptors are not necessarily well seen. It's like once again one of these things that I think sounds good but like I don't know if this applies really in real life. I don't know if people appreciate disruptors all that much. In chapter 4 he talks about his vices. Um, he talks about alcohol, smoking, poker, uh, video games, gambling on sports, working, con considers working a vice, which not sure that's a vice, but okay. Uh, <laughs> Dave has had some vices. We all knew about alcohol and we all also know that he stopped drinking alcohol. So I think that's commendable once again. But essentially, I am seeing once again that Rachel must have been miserable in this because like, those are a lot of vices to have. I do think that this chapter is vulnerable. I do appreciate that writing this and just putting it out there for the entire world to read is hard um, because it is, it is kind of vulnerable. It is kind of difficult to expose yourself like that. But at the same time, it just makes me more empathetic towards his children and wife, ex-wife. Uh, and potentially towards Heidi now because I just can't imagine I have dated men that have drank before um, but didn't necessarily have any other vices so uh, I can't imagine like drinking more than one should is already hard enough to deal with let alone adding in like 17 other vices. So this relationship was probably very hard for Rachel. Rachel also wrote a note to him in regards to all his vices. And she said, you want to get anxiety under control? Do the work. You want to drink less? Take it seriously. Get a plan. Stop before you have too much. I've been trying to help you with these problems for two years and I'm tired. Stop talking about it and start doing something about it. You're in control of your life. Your shame doesn't serve you when you make a mistake. Do the work, get the help if you need it, and stop making excuses. I love you, Dave, but I can't save you. You need to save yourself. And this is obviously unlike the first note that I opened this video with, which was actually an email, a business email, from the founder of the company to the CEO of the company, regardless of their personal relationship. This is a personal note. And... It just makes me think, the fact that Rachel had to put it in writing, makes me think she was not heard in that relationship. I have been in relationships where I had to write the long email and it was not like Rachel's email, it wasn't professional, it was just a long email expressing, and I've done this several times, it's not a strategy that works. If you don't feel heard in your relationship, it's very likely that the email will not be heard either or the note or whatever and I very much empathized here because I've been in that situation and I know how freaking awful it is not to be heard not to be just taken seriously when you're talking about things that are like important such as this like drinking and vices and stuff or in that case like him being the CEO of the company when it happened to me and it was very much like I said on a personal level you feel just very dismissed and you feel like, okay, I'm going to pour my heart out and hopefully they're going to hear it now, but they just don't. They just don't. Those relationships ended for me and this one ended for Rachel. So if you feel like you're in a position where you have to write a long email or a long note or whatever about things that are important to you because you're not being heard, you should consider that as a red flag. I also felt some empathy for Dave because he, I think he did love Rachel. Um, I wrote, I, I made a note on this page 38. Some of you may not be married to a woman as strong confident and crazy as Rachel Hollis. Let me channel her for those of you who need to hear this. You need to save yourself. This paragraph here really did make me think that he loved her, but I just don't think he was like good enough for her. I don't know if there was any way that he could have saved that because he just simply 
with all the stuff that is in this book, with all the stuff that we know about them at this point, I just don't think that he was good enough for her. Like, he seems to have tried after, or he uses these notes that Rachel wrote for him as reasons why he started trying harder and stuff, and I'm sure he did. It turned out eventually that it wasn't enough. It wasn't good enough. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. He says, don't be dumb. <laughs> Okay, so the reason I'm laughing at this is because basically Don't Be Dumb is something that Rachel wrote in her um, book. I uh, didn't see that coming. Let me see. Dave wrote Don't Be Dumb two or three times in uh, Get Out of Your Own Way in his first book. And Rachel wrote Don't Be Dumb once, I think, only um, in Didn't See That Coming, in which she essentially shames MLMers, people who have to buy a circuit, even though she was hired at these MLM conventions on a large number of occasions. So, and this is why I laughed so hard when I saw that, because like how, <laughs> how insensitive is it? And how arrogant at the same time, and how much Rachel shot herself in the foot with that sentence, don't be dumb. Because here's what she said, if you're not sure how to make extra income, there are so many ideas to help you, but please remember this important prerequisite. Figure out a way to make more income that doesn't cost you any money to start. For real, I'm positive someone is going to read this and be inspired to head over to the internet and ask how she could make some extra income. And then, four weeks later, her star kit has arrived for the new at-home business she just paid $700 to join. Don't be dumb. <laughs> These two are so arrogant and so unaware. The lack of self-awareness it must take for you, someone who has paid thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to speak at MLM conferences, for you to turn around and say don't be dumb to people who are in that audience. Rachel's audience is vastly made up of MLMers and she then turns around and calls them dumb for buying an MLM kit and for even though she has pushed them to try harder, to work harder, to blah blah blah. Like why did you speak at MLM conferences if you didn't believe in the MLM business structure? So that's why I was just a little shocked to see Don't Be Dumb two or at least twice in Dave's book. I think it's three times, but like, anyway. We remember how um, Rachel uses to you and for you. That's also a Rachel thing. You guys, when I'm telling you there are so many repetitions um, from this book to Built Through Courage, I'm not kidding you. Like, this is not an exaggeration. Remember when I talked about the fact that he was addressing the critics in Build Through Courage and he was talking about how if someone has a problem with you, it's not with you really, like it's, even though that is complete bullshit. Well, this is also in this book. He says, if someone does have a problem with something you're doing, it's likely they are challenged by it, feel insecure because of it, are jealous of your willingness to chase after it, or are frustrated that your belief in yourself makes them more aware of their disbelief in their own ability. This is bullshit. Again, as I said several times, I can have a problem with Dave because of the things that Dave does, and it has nothing to do with my insecurity and my will. I already talked about this. I I hate that I have to repeat myself because I don't do this. I don't just repeat the same video over and over again. But I have no choice because he repeats the information from one book to the other. So I'm repeating myself as a consequence. And I hate this. I don't want to repeat myself here. Don't you have an original thought to write? If you need to write another book, can you just write something new in it? Or are you just going to repeat exactly everything that you already wrote? Nothing else is interesting here. Talks about the imposter syndrome again. We already discussed this. Like he, he, yeah, he already said that the imposter syndrome was not covered in the documentary, both through courage. So um, I'm not sure how he could not cover the imposter syndrome where clearly he covered it in this book. So, okay, so this is interesting. On page 64, he talks about how they fought and how he always needed to be right. And once again, you guys, like, I don't know how she could stand him for that many years because he says, my wife isn't confrontational. She doesn't like to argue and isn't up for debate. I've used this knowledge in a way I convinced myself was to my advantage over time. It wasn't. If you're in pursuit of an exceptional relationship with your partner and still find yourself falling into the trap of needing to be right, it wouldn't work to your advantage either. 
It's taken a decade and a half of marriage to appreciate that my preying on her discomfort and arguments may have fed my ego and helped suppress my fear, but it came at the expense of showing up well for her. If I'm really honest, using my ability to win an argument with a person who is adverse to arguing made me a bully, the worst kind of ass. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So if you do show some self-awareness, but then you don't do anything about it, like what is that self-awareness good for, Dave? He then, oh, repetitions, repetitions, repetitions. He talks about the fixed mindset and growth mindset. I already addressed this in my previous video. Yeah, I, I understand it's a theory. I am sure that the theory is coming from somewhere. At the same time, I don't need to hear it twice from Dave and I don't know how many hundred times from other people. Like, I got it, I got it. He then talks about his tattoo. Once again, a repetition. This was also discussed in Built Through Courage. A ship in harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are built for. We understand you made an entire book with nautical references because of this tattoo. He also talks about his ally tattoo later in this book and in, yeah. So there's a lot, there's a lot of that. Interesting theory. Okay, so Dave has a chapter where he talks about how you should treat people really well because someday they might resurface in your life and they might be in a boardroom and they might be, you might be able to gain something from that. And I just think that's such a transactional way of looking at people. I think you should treat people nicely because everyone just tr deserves to be treated nicely, not because you might get something from them someday. And this part on page 97 is where he's like framing this ad as advice. This is how you should act. You should act nice because someday you might need something from someone and I understand that um, we live in a society and it is true that you know we are kind of like that but at the same time he later talks about the same concept with no self-awareness to the fact that he already wrote a chapter on this essentially telling people to be transactional later on he says that you should not be transactional and that he has applied that kind of thinking to relationships in the past and it didn't work well for him so it's like if you know <laughs> if like later on in the book you talk about how being transactional with people didn't necessarily help you then why didn't you just scrap this chapter in this advice? Because obviously this isn't good advice. But then you need to fill in the pages, right? Dave then moves on to talk about his and Rachel's relationship when they first met and how uh, he thought there was something about her and blah, blah, blah. And he talks about an experience that he had with another woman previous to Rachel who, you know, he showed up at her door and she was in bed with someone else and how that informed the way that he treated other women. And this is where I it clicked for me. And I was like, oh, this is a book of excuses. Oh, Rachel wrote this about me. So let me write a book to excuse myself because here's the backstory. I did this because I was also hurt by someone else. One, I'm sure that being hurt in that way sucks. And uh, we've all been hurt in our love lives one way or another. I also think, I just don't know. I guess I'm what I'm trying to say is I think this book is a passive aggressive, like I'm gonna get back at you, Rachel. I'm gonna get back at you, Rachel, because I think obviously he's just essentially trying to say, oh yeah, what Rachel said is true, but here's my side of the story. And I don't know, I feel a certain way about it. like. At the same time, it's better than Built Through Courage. I'm not sure what like my stance is here. I'm just trying to say, don't write a book as, basic, as a passive aggressive thing, I guess. Or write, I don't know. Then uh, he talks about the Rise Together conference, which got me angry because this is another one of these instances where they consider him, themselves experts and they're so confident in their abilities because they had this exceptional marriage. This exceptional marriage was a complete sham because they were struggling for years before declaring that they're going to divorce. And for those years that they were struggling, they put up a con uh, conference that cost 2000 pounds per ticket or up to two thousand dollars sorry um, and people had to pay to go to this conference but Rachel and Dave had no qualifications as, as therapists they didn't have therapists there and their only qualification was that they had an exceptional marriage which then dissolved and it ended in divorce and then when they did divorce they said it was because they struggled for years and years so you can't both say, we had an exceptional marriage, here's our conference, we're going to teach you how to have an exceptional marriage like ours, and 
later just turn around and be like, haha, it was just a joke. We actually had so many problems and you just paid like an idiot for our advice. Like, <sighs> obviously hindsight is twenty twenty. We didn't have a way to know that they were completely lying, even though I personally did have like, I'm very suspicious of self-help gurus, <laughs> let's just put it that way. But it's just like, it made me angry. It reminded me of that because like that's, what actually made me pivot in my uh, YouTube channel because I was making videos about living in Scotland and all that stuff at that point. And then after that, I went into the anti-self-help commentary sphere. I've not looked back ever since and I'll never look back because I think there's so much here to discuss. So uh, yet another one of these stories where Dave is just like, sounds like the most irritating man to be around when Rachel was giving birth to their first son or second son and she was on the back end of a 52 hour labor with our first son first son and the doctor came in and told her it was finally time to push I did what I knew she needed most I pulled up trick daddy's let's go and turned it up way up imagine after 52 hours of labor what you want is someone to just put a song on and turn it way up because that's what you need to push. Like, I just can't, like, he sounds like the most irritating person on this planet. He then moves on to talk about personality tests in the Enneagram in Myers-Briggs, which he has since debunked in the next book. Um, I appreciate the debunking of it because he was basing his relationship advice on in the Enneagram. The way he's talking about these Enneagram and Myers-Briggs tests, personality tests, the love language quiz. Um, he's talking about it like I had to put in the work and do these tests and realize that, you know, I must work for this. It's like, Dave, <laughs> that's not what working for a relationship means. Taking a personality quiz is not working for your relationship. You have to work to understand your partner but it's not through personality quizzes because these will be generic. You need to understand your partner, your partner, not what the quiz says that your partner is. Like, like this is so dumb. And if this is the level of effort he was putting into that marriage, like I can see why it ended very, very clearly. And one thing I wanted to say on page 116, he says, to be clear, I don't have a diary because while it may not seem like it, there are certain lines that even I will not cross for this book. Didn't they have like an entire line of start today journals? And I am sure that this was very much Rachel's thing. But at the same time, you can't, as at that point he was working for Rachel's company, you can be so hypocritical as to denounce one of the products that she has. Like a start today, a journal, a diary is pretty much the same thing, isn't it? Like, except for the fact that I think a diary doesn't have prompts that are written by Rachel Hollis. But it's the, it, that's what it is, isn't it? And I feel like it's just so hypocritical. There were so many clues in this book that they were like hypocritical about things. And I just don't appreciate, especially in retrospect, knowing what we know now, I just don't appreciate reading things like this, you know? Obviously, we have a situation where he is making it very clear you shouldn't take advice from unqualified people such as himself and his wife Rachel Hollis when it comes to marriage counseling. He says, have you ever been in a situation where the person giving you relationship advice couldn't themselves hold one down? In the same way, I wouldn't come to someone who was sorely out of shape for advice on working out. The idea of giving way to the opinions of someone who isn't excelling in their relationship is ridiculous. Yeah, it is fucking ridiculous, Dave. Plenty of people have tried to tell us the best way Rachel and I should be doing our marriage. If these voices came from people who are killing it in their own relationship, their thoughts are welcome. But if the feedback you're getting is from someone who can't keep a steady relationship, you better filter out their feedback as it does not come from a credible source. Yeah, thank you, Dave, for that enlightening piece of advice. Um, so why, again, did you sell tickets that cost almost $2,000 to marriage counseling when you then uh, were struggling with your then wife and then ended in divorce? At one point he does describe Rachel, this is on page 127. Rachel and I first dated when I was 26 years old and she was 18 going on 29. She was a baby. She was a small baby rabbit. I guess he's trying to appear endearing. This sounds very uh, bad to me. I don't like him describing 
someone he was having sex with as a baby. That's just me. He moves on to talk about how he was as a father at first and how he needed his beauty sleep um, while Rachel had to deal with crying babies because he had work to do. So yeah, once again, Dave, not an easy partner to have, not a good partner to have. I can't believe she stood by him for that many years. Oh, he also addresses the 3% charm that Rachel got. So you guys know the story? Okay, so basically what happened there is like so Rachel told him that she was dreaming of this thing and she had a potential opportunity for something and he was like, come on, babe, there's like a million to one chance of happening. Ugh. And she said, a million to one chance? They've already asked for follow-up meetings. So he gave her a 3% chance and then she made the 3% thing into a bracelet. So yeah, this is the kind of passive aggressive relationship they had. This is so bad. Now that's a masterclass in effective passive aggression and thank God for that, he writes on page 132. <laughs> it's seriously just... <laughs> Uh, in regards to the transactional mindset he talks about, I've operated in a surprisingly transactional mindset in all kinds of relationships over my lifetime. I've taken some philosophies about exerting leverage in a business deal to convince the other party to reciprocate and apply that same logic to my own personal relationship. In so many ways, that transactional mindset is built on a foundation of insecurity and fear. He previously talked about as like, here's what you should do. Now it's like, oh, here's what I've done, learn from me. Like, can you just make up your mind? <laughs> I don't know if he's aware that he wrote the same story, essentially, but in two, with two different pieces of advice, very contradictory pieces of advice um, attached. There's obviously the chapter where he talks about how much of an ally he was at Disney. He was, uh, he took a leadership position on a working women's initiative, which I'm like, why did you take that? That's not what an ally would do. You would just let a woman take take that leadership position for a women's working initiative. But then again, he also took a job that was his wife, a woman, in a w company that was meant for women. So, you know, the CEO job I'm talking about. So yeah, he's definitely not an ally to women. He talks about how he was an ally to the LGBTQ uh, community. And he talks about how he's an ally to the black community of color. So... I don't know it's just like this chapter really rubbed me the wrong way because like I did not appreciate once again Dave tooting his own horn and he says like I'm not trying to toot my own horn but he, but he is tooting his own horn about how much of a good ally he is in so many different things so yeah he he's and he talks about his ally tattoo obviously in that thing which again repetition um but also on one side i think we should talk about these things i think these are important conversations to have and on the other side i don't like the way he talked about it so i guess what i'm trying to say is like i don't appreciate the way he talked about it but i do think this is these are important conversations to have but it's Dave Hollis, so my, my my requirements are pretty much in the dirt for him at this point. Tall people can be runners. We already discussed how this is a repetition again. Uh, yeah, so there is just a lot of that, and I'm, I'm trying to get to something that is not a repetition. Once again, towards the end of the book, we're on page 179, he talks about how Rachel and him had date night on Thursday every week and how Rachel and him would go on vacation with the kids and then on vacation separately just them without the kids and well <laughs> you understand what he's trying to get at that you should make time for your partner and I am currently single so I don't know if that's true should you make yeah I'm sure you should at the same time I don't know if everyone can afford to have two holidays one with the kids one without so our calendar was a reflection of the kind of marriage Rachel and I wanted to have Rachel and you ended up breaking up. So the calendar thing and the date night on Thursday and the makeout sessions that sound a lot more prudish than I would have liked to see from Dave. I don't know. It's just like, uh, like looking back when you, when you know that they break up and it's just a little kind of like hypocritical to read. Like we were doing all these things to have an exceptional marriage. You should do as we did. Don't do as they did. And towards the very end, once again, he talks about the power of visualizing the worst case scenario. I already touched on this. So there is now repetition within the same book. <laughs> we're not even talking. Repeat the same information from one book to the other. We're talking repeat the same information within the same book a few chapters later. Rachel articulated in a kind but direct way that if I were to make 
maintain my traje- trajectory, we would not be married in three years. Yeah, she did. She, she said it on Louis House interview. And I have used this clip in my previous my first video about them and their divorce. You paint a picture of what it would mean to have your family fall apart. It's a dark exercise. Once again, this is the same advice that I find it could be very anxiety inducing to some people. So I'm not sure that it's an exercise that would work for everyone. Obviously, we are very well aware that this is a, this is a strategy that worked for Dave and it may not necessarily work for everyone. But at the same time, I feel like the way they're talking about these things in self-help books is very much like, you should do this, this works, this works. But very much you could say, this doesn't work for everyone, this worked for me, but not everyone is like me, you know? And in the same breath, he also talks about how if you're consuming more positive things, you'll tend to be a person who sees the world through a more positive lens. So which one is it? Do you have to do the dark exercise and paint a picture of what it would mean to have your family fall apart? Or should you see things through a more um, positive lens? Like, just make up your mind. You can both preach toxic positivity and toxic negativity at the same time. He uses Rachel's thing, not today, Satan, at one point. And that is about it. I've just reached the end of the book. You guys, I felt really kind of shocked in reading this. I don't know. I just think this book really shows the roadmap to divorce. <laughs> this is mean to say, but this is uh, like hindsight is twenty twenty. I'm repeating myself here too. But like now we know that this led him to divorce Rachel or, or rather led Rachel to divorce him. So it's just a strange read. It was enlightening in so many ways. There were things I didn't know and I kind of wish that I read the book when it came out. But at the same time, with the knowledge I have today, I feel like I am seeing things through a different lens. And um, I will give Rachel kudos for standing him for as many years as she did. What was that, 17 or something? Basically, he appears as a complete and utter dick of a man. He appears as the worst kind of partner, a partner who blasts music while you're in labor and you're about to push, a partner who's not there, who's like drinking on holiday by himself and not hanging out with the family and um you know who just you have to hold accountable even as you gave him the ceo role in your own company that you founded and that you put spent years like 15 years building up partner that you have to write notes for because he doesn't hear you when you talk to him i very much relate to that kind of partner that just doesn't really do any of the work and you feel like you're alone in trying and you try and try and try and after a while you're like okay i'm, I'm out of here this is never going to work so um yeah i just thought this was interesting to talk about now and i hope that you guys took something from it i hope you enjoy this video but yeah this is pretty much the end so thank you very much for watching um, once again, please don't forget to subscribe, like this video if you like it. Thank you to my patrons as always, and I'll see you guys in my next video. Bye! It sound right, boy.